and they're here to see the giants of the wrestling world, Mountain BG and Matilda the Hun. You could say Glow was a show about women's wrestling, but briefly, we'll never describe it. Women's wrestling. Now, it's been around for years, but never quite like this. It was something new. It was women kind of taking over. These beauties are bound to destroy each other. Professional wrestling uh, basically was a male-dominated sport. Glow was something that really gave the, the female athletes a chance to get on TV and excel. There was no male image on Glow. There was no big guys leading us to the ring, and it was all women. I always kind of thought of it as like a vaudevillian show <laughs> mixed with a little bit of like Saturday Night Live mixed with, you know, female wrestling. It was the 80s. Everyone had money, everyone was young and happy and, and out running around having fun. The sexual climate was charged. We're standing there in our giant glittery hair and little outfits. It wasn't just wrestling. We had the little skits and we sang the songs. And it was very cartoon character, like good guys and bad guys. And I felt like it was very empowering. We're strong and we're capable, and there's nothing wrong with being a professional athlete. That's true. It was women coming out. It was so unusual to see a bunch of girls, number one, rapping. So we were rapping in these little short costumes. <laughs> The Chicago Bears were very popular, and they had come out with their rap. And so rapping at that level was kind of trendy. Everything was exaggerated. It poked fun at the economics. It poked fun at the Cold War with Russia. It went beyond what the World Wrestling Federation had ever done. Matilda the Hun. Because of our, our wild makeup, and our scampy costumes, and the fact that we weren't afraid to call it entertainment. American whips are all the same. They cry like babies when I give them pain. I fight to win, and that's for sure. America, I'm superior. Music, comedy, and real good fighting, and bitch fighting is good. People love that. It doesn't have to be, is wrestling real, is it fake? It doesn't matter because they're like, they're like live comic strip characters. And that's what makes it fun. We have got a cracker jack show today, fans. The comic book hero, Lightning, squares off against the British bombshell, Godiva. We were all a character, and we were in that character mode pretty much 24-7. We had to call each other by our character names. We were not allowed to call each other by street and air. Real names. Real names. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had to be MTV and Jailbait. As a matter of fact, it's hard for me, even looking back, to remember whose name, what the real name really is. From Beverly Hills, California, <laughs> Tina Harare! I 
am Lisa Moretti, and I played the part of Tina Ferrari on The Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, and actually was part of the original group that shot the pilot. I've got so much respect for Tina Ferrari. She's one of the most beautiful women in GLOBE. She fights fairly, and she never breaks the rules. When we first got the call, we're gonna go to this audition. It's about ladies wrestling. We're like, come on, I don't wanna do that. Bunch of big girls throwing me around. I have no, no idea or no, no desire to know about wrestling. I don't know anything about it. And why would we wanna go get beat up? You know, come on. She says, well, I think they're paying us to show up. Okay, I'm there. Well, I was in the medical field. I was a phlebotomist, somebody who draws blood in a lab. And I wanted to be an actress. Well, I got with the agency, and the agency happened to have this audition. They did an open call, and they didn't advertise that there was gonna be any type of wrestling whatsoever. Now, when I got there, there was a bunch of girls there, and um, this guy comes out and says, this is going to be about women's pro wrestling, and I swear to God, a third of the girls got up immediately, and they left. Tina and Ashley. We really kinda didn't know what the hell we were doing as far as TV. I, I think that some girls were there because they wanted to be in television. Like my tag team partner, Ashley, she was called upon to show up for an audition for a TV show, of which she did several auditions during the week for different kinds of shows. This was just one of them. I got this call from my agent to go on this audition. Very exciting children's show, and I was very jazzed about it. I was looking at it as a stepping stone to being this big actress. This was an opportunity for us, you know, to be on TV, get started with something, and then you just kind of hope that it evolves into, you know, something bigger. I mean, these were not like creme de la creme model girls. They, we, we didn't cast from, you know, bikini model agencies or anything. These were girls that got an acting casting call. Imagine having an idea of putting good-looking girls in the ring and they figure, first let's make them good looking, then let's see if they can wrestle. Nowadays, there's all kinds of like wrestling camps and wrestling schools. There wasn't really any of that. It was a lot uh, more closed up than that. They started the camp, I call it Camp Glow. <laughs> Sleazy old smelly gym. It was nasty and stinky and dirty and the, the mats had blood stains on them and each corner had a spittoon. When I showed up, there was at least 100 girls there to actually go through the physical audition for GLOW. Imagine, beautiful girls that you kind of can't relate to, you know, because I never really felt like I was one of those. And then up in the ring, in the dirty, stinky ring, is Mondo. And he looked like the only guy in the room that fit. One of the famed Guerrero family, Mondo Guerrero, and the family was tremendous. Gory Guerrero, he had the sons, Chavo Guerrero, Mondo Guerrero, Hector Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero, wrestling dynasty almost, and he trained the girls. Poor Mondo, he took the gig as a gig, you know, he's getting having a payday, right? This poor guy shows up and he's thinking, what the hell am I gonna do with all these things? How am I gonna make them ready for a wrestling show on television? So one of the things that Mondo did is he demanded everyone's respect and attention. He gets us doing some drills, and of course you can't start throwing us around. I mean, you gotta take it in way baby steps. People can get hurt just getting into a wrestling ring. So, I mean, not two minutes later, these blonde girls were hanging on the ropes. I think he was teaching us how to sell pain, you know, how to act like we're writhing in pain, which is kind of funny, and it's kind of hard to do for the first time. But these girls started laughing to grab the respect they had, that I needed on those girls on me. I grabbed one, I forgot who it was. Telling me it was fake and I grabbed her and I put her to sleep. What, knocked her out right there in front of everybody could see it. When she went down, she started flip flopping like a fish. They believed then, they believed then. And from then on, it was nothing but serious work with it. And instead of feeling sorry for her, I was just like, I love this man. I am so sold on this. I want to come back for some more. The training to me was hardcore. The training was oh was so painful. I could barely walk down the hall at going like this. You know, it's like oh, gotta lift my arm to push the button on the 
on the elevator to get down. I got to go back down and beat myself up again. We were working four hours in the morning with like a, an hour, two hour break, and then four hours in the afternoon. It was almost like they wanted to see if they could break you. Wanda said, OK, which one of you girls can ram your head into the turnbuckle, turn over, and land on your back? And I was the first one. And like, I can do it. I can do it. And they would drill on little things. Like, when we get a body slam, we always land like this. Well, let's practice that. Boom, 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 boom. Chin, chin to the chin, chin to the chin, chin to the chin. You have to, have the timing, the timing of the arm hitting the back at the same time. You're rolling back and forth, on your, just rolling. Then you start lifting one leg up, boom. Then the other one, boom. Then the other one, boom. Then both of them, boom. Then both of them, then you get up and boom. Then you get up to the top rope and you go, boom. And if you can control that, you can take anything. The ones that made it, the ones that stuck through, it surprised you because it wasn't the obvious choices, it wasn't who you thought it was gonna be. It was just boom, boom, boom. I mean, it all just happened so quickly at that point. And before I knew it, I was packing my bags in LA and uh, moving out to Las Vegas to the Riviera Hotel. In the beginning, we were staying at, actually at the Riviera Hotel. They took a stage, they turned it into a sound stage for the show, and moved us into our rooms, and that was it. They wanted us actually to get rid of our apartments, wherever any of us were living. The suggestion went out, you know, that you don't need it, you're gonna be living here. At first, when you show up in Vegas, and you're living in the Riviera, and you're on the Strip, and you're seeing all these lights, three days of it is just amazing. The fourth day, you're seeing circus, 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 <laughs> circus, 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 and you want to shoot somebody. It was like real, you know, Squaresville. So it was hard to kind of feel um, like you had a life, you know? So the emotional and the psychological change that you were exploring, that was traumatic at times. After a couple of weeks, they got us apartments, literally just down the street from the Riviera. Once we were chosen, and it was sorted that you're a good girl, you're a bad girl, you know, we, you know, roomed that way. When we go to the Riviera, to the buffet, you know, or, or if they say we were just walking through the casino, uh, for whatever, we would have stay in character, you know, good girls over there, bad girls over there. Fiji is going to town, fan. Hey, stop it, Matilda the Hunt. Stop it. One of the best ones at it was dementia. Demi, without any makeup on, could just I mean, she could just walk through, and the girl could go without batting her eyes for over 10 minutes. Hey, you, don't yourself down. You're about to see the best show in town. It was a very, very surreal place to be, because you had freedom, but not enough to do what you kind of wanted to do. <laughs> They really wanted to monopolize as much time as they could have. They didn't want us to have any life of our own outside of GLOW. We had curfews. We had a definite set of rules and regulations about stuff like partying and late nights and all that stuff. You know, good couldn't hang out with the bad, bad couldn't hang out with the good. We got fined, $50 fine if we got caught, and $250 fine if we weren't home on, by a certain time. By the way, you're two weeks late with the rent. The ones that were, quote, the wild ones got the room with me, you know, and Mama would always make sure that they were in bed, you know, by 10, you know, in the room by 10, in bed by 11, you know. <laughs> All the girls were in fear of getting busted for a curfew, and, and then we'd be sneaking around doing stuff just to get away with it. We'd be out late, we'd try and sneak in, we would um, have all these code words for going to do our laundry and all kinds of stuff. I, I always got in trouble. We were very tightly reined and I was just a little bit rebellious. And I was thinking, you know what, I'm, I'm 24 years old. I can do what I want. All right, all right, quiet down, girls. I got a new rule for you. 
for you. No more cooking in the locker room. We've got complaints from the neighbors. Seems your food drove all the rats next door. My name is Stephen Blance. Originally, I was the behind-the-scenes person, first the comedy writer and then the head writer. And then in the second season, I became the referee. Hey, I'm the ref. Obey the rules. Don't try and make us look like fools, because I'm the law, and there's no doubt. If you do wrong, I'll count you out. In order to describe what happened for women on the glow set, I think you have to get an idea of what was happening with women's wrestling at the time. First of all, women's matches were a rarity. They were an oddity. There were two things that drew people. They were midgets, always packed the house, and ladies packed the house, because it was unusual. And so they weren't used a lot. They were used to bring in people and, and build the house up, you know, sell more tickets. Until GLOW, there really wasn't a glamorous exposure of women. Women were thought of as uh, dykes, unfeminine. Why would you join wrestling? There's something wrong with you. You know, that was kind of the attitude. If you weren't signed by a big organization, what you did was basically drive all day through states to get to the arena to wrestle for maybe 15 or $20. I was a wrestler before GLOW, and they wouldn't let me wrestle a man. Not allowed in the State Athletic Commission. So they told me I could wrestle a bear. So they put me in the ring with a 750-pound, seven-foot bear, and I lasted longer than the men. And so they knew they had somebody formidable to deal with, and I wasn't going anywhere, <laughs> you know? Places where they would have wrestling were kind of slimy in those days, especially for women. Now comes this TV show, one hour every week of women's wrestling. <laughs> From the Riviera Hotel in the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas, Nevada, it's the show with more battling beauties, more amazing action, and more smiles per hour. The all-new Glow, gorgeous ladies of wrestling. It was a small, low-budget show. I used to make jokes about it being so low-budget and the promoter being so cheap that I put David McLean in a phone booth and said his office was the phone booth. Hello, Allstate Insurance. This is David McLean from Glow Productions. Have I got a great idea for you. For a small fee, I can let you use Matilda the Hun as a spokesperson for your homeowner's policy. You see, if they don't want to renew, she can threaten to come over to their house. <laughs> Hello? Glow was created by David McLean. It was a dream that he had to bring wrestlers on television, and female wrestlers, because David had watched wrestling since he was a little boy, and he was just a huge fan. So he finally had these auditions and had all the talent, but he really needed the money for the show to run. He got introduced to Matt Simber somehow. Our director was Matt Simber who is a Hollywood legend. He started on stage, was married to Jane Mansfield, and he went to Hollywood to direct films. He actually directed Liza Minnelli's first show and Orson Welles' last film appearance. Let's get some order in this court. I said, what's so funny? We're the ones they call the Black Six. Matt Simber, the infamous Matt Simber. Matt Simber was a trip. He was very hard, very strict. Matt Simber was very good friends with Mr. Rickless, who owned the Riviera Hotel and was married to Pia Zadora at that time. He was, he was big time. Matt and Mr. Rickless were friends going way back. Matt had directed movies for Mr. Rickless uh, with his wife, Pia Zadora. Matt drove a Maserati, which I later, later found out was a gift from Mr. Rickless for doing one of the movies. They had a very close relationship. Mr. Rickless really took care of Matt. To get Rickless, you had to keep Simber, and to have Simber, you had to have Rickless. But I don't know that David necessarily wanted Simber to direct the show, because I think David kind of thought he was taking reins, and he wanted a little bit more creativity with it. I'm David McLean. I'm your host. You've seen my glow girls coast to coast. You've seen them fight and take a stand. They've conquered all of TV land. His idea was to combine the glamour 
and the grit. Matt's idea was to make it all campy, ridiculous, silly. He had to have Matt to have the money. So that's how we got Matt Simber as our director. Matt Simber was very clever. While he, the girls were training, he watched them, and he developed their characters largely out of who they already were. Glow was a character-driven show. It was really designed to emphasize each character. For me, I really lived and breathed Little Egypt. We were in the ring for the first time, kind of all, you know, getting stretched and warmed up, and, and Matt Simber walked up to me and he goes, jailbait. <laughs> all you girls are such a disgrace. Just wait till mama owns this place. At ringside, I'll cast my spell, and you'll be among the bodies that fail. As to how a big bank mama came to be, as far as I know, this was a concoction of Matt Simber. Tonight, because of my voodoo, you will grovel at our feet. You understand? Yes. She was supposed to be the Louisiana voodoo queen. I would like throw dust on them and then they'd be under my power and I'd make them do things that they wouldn't normally do. Would it be? I think Fiji is caught in a spell. They had a costume for me and I hated it. And I wore it right in the beginning, but I started changing the costume. Hey, I'm Hollywood. Sure, I like to have fun, but I don't mess with drugs. I'd go into a lingerie shop and I'd get corsets and gloves and fishnets and I started creating that character the way I saw her fit. They saw me as a bad guy right away. Don't know why. They came up with Godiva and I sort of researched it and gave her a British accent and said, hey, can I have a horse? From Coventry, England, the British bombshell, Godiva! He took their quirks or their whatever it was about them that made them unique, and he says, that's you, just magnify it. You're that person. Magnify so, it and put it in outer space I on guess some you of them. <laughs> Arlene and Phyllis. The ropes are not too high. We were in our 20s, you know, doing 65. They wanted sexy housewives. And I'm like, no, if you want us to create characters, we're not, we're not doing sexy housewives. They're not good or bad. Everyone's a whore. Very nice for the little children to be half naked. That's very good. You know, to them, <laughs> they're all, whore. they all the women, all the girls are whores. So, you know, we're just there to clean up. Yeah. It was really fun to do, and it was, it was no stress at all. It was no stress. And the wrestling that we did in that was just as bad as we were, as wrestling as housewives was as bad of wrestlers as we really were. We sucked. We were. really sucked. I mean, we were. I got injured while we were training, and I thought, oh, I am not, I am not going to hurt myself again. So when we did, you know, Spike and Chainsaw, everything was... Um, about special effects. At a combined weight of 310 pounds from the heavy metal capital of the world, Los Angeles, Chainsaw and Spike, the heavy metal sister. Donna's favorite movie at the time was the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We were all standing around. She said, how about the name Chainsaw? And Simber goes, yeah. And then somebody goes, and she can cut stuff up and have a real blade. I'm just listening to this. And he's going, yeah, yeah. And then he hands me some money and goes, go to Sears and get the chainsaw and assemble it. I'm thinking, my god, I'm a Jew from the valley. We hire people to do this. I don't, I'm not mechanically inclined. Contusions, bruises, a gaping hole. A fight with chainsaw really takes its toll. Come wrestle with me, I'm so insane. The only sensation you'll feel is pain. Ah! I'm super heavy metal bound. When it comes to fight, I don't mess around. They say I'm evil. They call me Spike because I use my torch. Whenever I strike, We'd set stuff on fire and cut stuff up. Who gets to do that? And I have to give Matt Simber a lot of credit for that because he did, he knew what was gonna work. When he met with us pre-production, before we actually aired, 
uh, he, was, he would just use that as his opportunity to drill in our minds what he expected from all of us. And then afterwards, if he didn't get it, he used that opportunity to drill <laughs> how we let him down, how we failed at our jobs. I remember Matt telling me that, you know, our job was to get the performance out of the talent, the girls, in any way we could, with cajole them, you know, encourage them, whatever it took to get that performance. And, and that made sense to me, and, and so that's what we did. Matt called me fat almost every day of my life, which was very frustrating. Um, told me I had a fat ass all the time. Um, if I put olives on my salad, I remember one time on tour, he told me how fattening olives are. It didn't matter who you were, people's but buttons were being pushed. I was just a kid, I was 19, so for me, you know, it was, it was worse than getting screamed at by a parent because it just comes out of nowhere and you just don't really even know how to handle it. So it was, it's borderline terrifying. We were having one of our nightly meetings at the Glow House and we were watching videotapes or whatever and I don't know, it was like Matt saw me up on the screen and he goes, tell me, he goes, your ass looks like a bunch of mashed potatoes. <laughs> and I was just so hurt and but he was just so mean he just did that in front of everybody he did that that was that was a um a common um what motivational tool he would use was to in front of like humiliate you in front of everybody one of the first things that a leader does they start to manipulate their group so that they act and behave the way they want them to so he had all these strategies that are real similar to what you would do if you were a abusive husband or, you know, a verbally abusive wife or a, you know, all that kind of sicko stuff. But, you know, maybe it comes with being as genius and creative as he was. Let me he tell you, Matt that. Sember joins us. You're the creator and TV director of GLOW. You feel you're presenting a new image for women. Is that so? They have a great image for young, young girls, particularly our demographics show that most of the people who watch GLOW, the largest segment are college students which see, who see the camp and the fun. Okay, and a lot of young girls who really emulate them. They, they show What's women the as independents. <laughs> Glow wasn't meant to be successful. Glow was almost an infomercial. It was done with commercials with Fabergé and Brut and the Riviera Hotel, because Michelle and Rickless owned all those companies. And he was putting the commercials into the television show and then giving it away. Don't be a fool, fool. You Fabergé, your mama knows best. It's only a rumor, so no one can quote me that it's gospel. But originally, GLOW was supposed to have been a tax write-off. It wasn't really thought that we were going to be a success. <laughs> mm -mm. Bingo, we made money. You like this violence? <laughs> It was just exciting. People at first didn't know what to make of it, but they watched, and it grew. If you're not watching wrestling, you're missing a major part of our culture. We sold our show to 200 markets, the very first television convention. All of a sudden, it became the water cooler show. People were talking about it. Many people across the country now are watching a new syndicated TV show called GLOW, which stands for Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. The Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Will you please welcome the Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling, the girls of GLOW. Every week, the ratings seemed to go up. We were beating other shows, you know, other wrestling shows in the same time slot. They'd never seen anything like this. And the male wrestlers were jealous, and they'd stopped in their tracks and sneer at us. Godiva, specifically, what's the very first game you ever learned to play? Candyland. There it is. All these shows knew who we were. I didn't know that Married with Children executive producers knew who we were. So, what time's your match? I don't know. I just hope I don't get another car salesman. They bite. <laughs> Count your blessings. Lawyers leave greasy spots. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, check this out. Playboy, December 89. I'm just gonna show you something really fast because I think this is the one that was signed by Hugh Hefner himself. Look at that. 
he signed my picture. I'll give you this. There you go. <laughs> oh, look at that lipstick. It looks awful. Look at my hair. It looks like it looks like wheat. Dried up wheat. When we got Jackie Stallone to be our manager, the good girls manager. She was really the star. We were really excited to have her. This is Sylvester Stallone's mother, Jackie Stallone, right here. The movement was growing. We were getting really popular in some major markets and didn't know it until we went to a press conference in LA. And we're walking down the street and people are going nuts. Oh my God, it's Nanochka. Oh my God, it's Fiji. Oh my God, it's like, and we're like, oh my God. You know, it's like we were on a different planet. Hi everybody, I'm Babe, the farmer's daughter. When I did the Donahue show and Married with Children and got two page spread in the TV guide, I was like, whoa. I don't think I even wanted to look at it. I just was enjoying what I was doing and having fun. I just was so happy to be doing the show. Now, I assume most of you could get a job, you know, on one of the big shows in Vegas, walking out with no top. And uh, isn't that a lot easier? Um, not for me. I, I couldn't walk out with no We were constantly in character. I became Nanochka um, because I was Nanochka 24-7. Nanochka had so much confidence, and she wasn't afraid of anything. And it was very free to be her. I could say anything I wanted to. Tina Ferrari's the capitalist dream. She won't look so cute face down in the ring. She thinks she's so sexy and so very strong. I will destroy her. It won't take long. I was actually engaged during GLOW, but the guy fell in love with Ninochka, and he thought I was that strong and that confident and that, and when he found out I wasn't really like that, it was, he dumped me really quick. Isn't that sad? <laughs> Little Egypt should never wear her veils into the ring. When she wrestles, she should wear a shroud. <laughs> Sometimes we'd have to just go and do like promotional parties and stuff, and I have no idea how I ended up alone at a party without knowing anybody. And I'm in character, and people are laughing at me. And finally, I'm just like, I'm going, I hate this. So this, these four people in particular were laughing. It just so happened that I was leaving and they were leaving. And so now we're in some parking garage, <laughs> I'm walking behind them and they're kind of giggling at me. And then, I don't know why, but I increased my, my stride. And then they were like, oh, she's, she's coming faster. And I could hear them say that, she's coming faster. So they start to go faster. I was like, oh yeah? They're running to their car and they're opening and they can't get in fast enough and there's somebody at the back of the and she's coming. And I ended up being able to actually say to one of them, I said, you know, you may want to think twice before you laugh at somebody. I said, because they might just follow you home and kill you. <laughs> and she's like, oh my, oh my God. Fans, these are some of the finest athletes in all of sports. They've got their training in the streets, on the farm and in the ring. And this match is already hotter than a fire. When we filmed the show in Las Vegas, fans would come from all over the United States just to see the show. The showroom at the Riviera Hotel only fit 200 people, and it got to be too much because there'd be 2,000 people waiting outside the door to get in, so they said, we gotta move to a bigger facility. And even then, people would be outside hoping that somebody get tired and go so they can come in. In the moment, I didn't really realize it was a huge deal. When we went on the road, we got some indicators, especially into the South and places like that where wrestling was huge. People were out in, in massive numbers everywhere we went. People are, they want an autograph so bad. I had the hardest time leaving. I was probably the last one on the bus every time. Oh, I used to love to make a boo. If I get them the boo, and I make children cry. Oh, that was good. Matilda the Hun loved to eat raw meat, and she would just take a raw steak and just like eat it in the ring and be like, I'm gonna eat you next, you little kid. Uh, and, and the kids would scream, you know, they, they were really afraid of her. I can sort of tell from the fan mail that I got, which was probably three to 400 letters a week. And they were from little kids saying, gee, I wanna be just like Susie Spirit when I grow up. What do you eat for breakfast? People would send jewelry, money. Some little boy stole his mom's wedding ring and sent it to Sally, the farmer's daughter, because he just loved her. And it came in a regular envelope. Like, he just stole it from his mom and stuck it in there and sent it to her. 
It was never the intention to, to be a kid's show. It's just, that's just how it unfolded and developed. I love that the show was geared towards kids, but also was really super palatable to those guys in fraternity houses that would wake up with their hangovers and watch us on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. She's got to buy the fur. She grabs a garbage can and dumps Bramlina right where she belongs. We got away with a lot. There was a lot of politics going on in those sketches. It was politically incorrect, and everybody loved it. Matt Simber pushed the envelope every possible way he could. He tried to offend every group that he possibly could. I'm going to take all of the jewels, take them out and sell them so I can buy military abs for my country. Sometimes I didn't really think about the horrible things I was saying about America. We were in Alabama or somewhere in the South, and apparently they were actually afraid for my safety because there was a whole big group there um, in the audience that actually really wanted to come and kill me. I probably stepped on the American flag or did something really horrible like that. Attila the Hun in Hollywood and Vine versus Fiji, little Fiji and Americana. Here's the American girls coming in, and here comes Matilda the Hun and Hollywood and Vine. Uh, marching in, Deutschland, Deutschland. It was amazing. <laughs> That's what got the audience fired up. They were performing along with us because they could so identify with whatever character they, wa they had wanted to be. Good versus evil. That's one of the underlying messages. The good guys usually won. Mount, uh, excuse me, Fiji. <laughs> yes, I am Mountain Fiji. I am originally from Pango Pango, American Samoa. Uh, fortunately, I made the 1980 Olympic team. Unfortunately, we had a, a boycott with Afghanistan, so I couldn't make it. But uh, thank God for GLOW, because uh, it's been a very special uh, entity for me. And uh, God bless everybody who's been tuning in. And uh, see you at the Riviera Hotel and Casino. Yeah. Mount Fiji was an Olympic shot putter. She was a Samoan who was 5'10", 350 pounds, and the nicest, gentlest, sweetest woman. Fiji was absolutely 100% dedicated to GLOW. She loved it. She believed in it. She made us believe in it. Glow's a hit from coast to coast. No need to brag, no need to boast. Let's have a luau with the roast. From Fiji to the fans, I'll make the toast. She was very, very strong. She could pick you up and throw you without moving her feet. Matt said she could never leave her feet, and nobody could get her off her feet, even when, like, six people tried to do it. I love Mount Fiji. I used to call her Shirley Temple <laughs> because the, she was so good and so forthright. When she picked me up over her head and threw me out of the ring, it was just spectacular. Unbeknown to the public, a lot of times we roomed together. But, you know, when that red light came on, it was good versus evil out there. You know, I'm doing my part and she was doing hers. She was very gentle wrestling, even. You know, she was very uh, delicate when, you know, she slammed into you. It was in a gentle way. <laughs> she was a gentle giant. <laughs> Which five of you ladies claim you could lift me over your head? Raise your hand. <laughs> no, come on, Fiji. No way in heck could you do that, hun. Yes, I can. No, no you can't. No. The reason you can't is because I won't let you. That's the biggest reason. Yeah. And you stay away from me, Pete. <laughs> no. You stay away from me. <laughs> My name is Emily Dole, and I portrayed Mountain Fiji on Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. <laughs> I haven't done that in 15 years. <laughs>
Los Angeles were trying to uh, form a women's football team. So I went to try out, but it flopped. So they told us to uh, try out for this character. So it's, it's going to be a wrestling show. And I said, wrestling show? So I went to where the audition was, and Matt Simber came out, and he said, he just looked out the room, he goes, I want to see you. I want to see you right now, right now, right now. I said, oh, my God. So I went inside and said, okay, turn around, turn around, turn around. Very good, very good. You like children? I said, yes, I love children, sir. Do you know how to impersonate characters, like, you know, actors and actresses? I go, Carmen Miranda. I go, tico, 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 I heard Big Bad Mama tried to strangle your pet vegetable. Ooh, she, she made Artie choke. Ah. All right, you're hired. See you in about a week in Vegas. I go, oh, really? I go, okay, okay. He goes, yeah. So I paid my ticket, and I was to report to the Rio Hotel, and they said, this is your room, your keys, and uh, thank, good, good luck to you here. I said, thank you. So I made the team. I think GLOW was probably the most important thing Mount Fiji ever did because she created a character that was loved and respected by the fans as well as her co-wrestlers. Everything I've done, I'm very proud of because when I look back, I go, there's nobody that could have done that kind of role. And she slams it to the mat. Incredible, that's over 350 pounds. Anyone else would need a crane to lift her. The Mount Fiji character, that was a big, um, that was a big diamond that was shining bright for me on the top of the mountain. And I've been to the top of the mountain. I like dropped back right now, just for a little bit. Her life after GLOW was difficult and she suffered a lot uh, emotionally, mentally, physically. She's in a nursing home. She's been in a nursing home for years. Uh, came to the rescue, Charles. <laughs> Way too much on the same thing, okay? Now okay. Pull, pull the sheet, okay? Okay. Ready? One, yeah. two, three. Oh, thank God. Bless your heart. Oh. Well, from what I understand about Fiji, now she has very bad knees, and the weight has been a real issue for her, and I think she may have diabetes, too. Many people from their weight get diabetes. Thank God I never did. I don't think she regularly worked out, you know, and I always have, so I don't know if that's a difference or not. I mean, wrestling is a serious, you can get really injured. I mean, most of the injuries, you do it to yourself in a way. Wrestling is probably not the best thing for a woman's body. It doesn't mean that women can't do it and do it really well, but you're getting hit by a car every day. And here's where a lot of the injuries come. Lot, what I found out a lot is that they most of them like to reach over and they don't believe that their, their, their butt can go over their head and they're going to be safe. So they like to arch and try not to, they wrestle the move. They don't accept it. I got injured in the ring and I couldn't wrestle anymore. Both of my shoulders, I have torn rotator cuffs. I totally lost my ACL ligament in my right knee. That wasn't from a fall, that was from uh, that was from the mats not put together correctly at the time on match day. And the paramedics make their way back to the ring, but this time to tend to the fallen dancing girl. The ring wasn't a standard wrestling ring. It, it was plywood with carpet foam. And the edges of the ring weren't covered. And I caught my knee on the edge of that plywood, and I tore my meniscus and my ACL. Oh, what devastating big splash. I didn't want to get fired. And I just sat there, and I was in Ooh. agony. There's no way to fight without really fighting. I've never found out how to do that. I mean, we had to connect. We had audience on four sides. If you didn't connect, they'd start chanting, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And it doesn't make for good television with an entire room of people chanting that. There was pushing and more pushing, you know, of like, do bigger, do better. 
the crowd would be out there chanting and chanting and going, you know, break her arm, break her arm. But anybody that's seen the footage of Susie Spirit's arm coming out, I mean, they replayed it a million times. No, nobody wanted that to happen. There it is, the bone that was torn from its socket. And this is the incident that caused it, the headhunter pushing that right leg into Susie Spirit's right arm and pinning it back, tearing and shredding that elbow. It's awful. It was just as much my fault as it was Bobby's fault. I jumped over her, went to grab the outside of her legs. She stumbled, and when she fell, it pushed my arm backwards. So I tore the tendon off. And it was actually laying there on the mat, and I had to pick it up. The doctor came in, and I thought, oh, could you just put my elbow back in, because I have to go to work tonight. And he said, oh, no. We're going to set your arm, and then we're going to put you in a cast, and it's going to be about six to eight weeks. Well, then I needed the Demerol. <laughs> I was OK with the injury, and I was OK with it healing, but I was not OK with it taking six to eight weeks. And I think the rush of everything and it really being reality and not just another part of the script started to sink in. I always felt I needed to do the big moves along with the little girls. I felt I should show them that anything can be done, and I did, and I enjoyed it, but I didn't realize the impact it would have on my spine. You don't know when you turn 50 what's gonna happen. You know, and I, I didn't get famous until I was 35. And that's when you should be retiring. Matilda, one, two, three. It's an upset. Tammy Jones is the winner. We'll be back in a moment. There's many times when I've questioned, why am I doing this? Because it is insanity. Uh, you get a lot of kudos from the audience, and it really amps you up and gets your adrenaline going, and you think you're superhuman. And then, of course, I was always a daredevil and had to prove I'm superhuman. I would jump from the top ropes right onto the cement. And, you know, I've always been 250, 300 pounds. That's a lot of weight. Uh, gravity takes its toll. I questioned myself so many times why I continued to do this. And I lo it still loved it, no matter what. You have challenged uh, Hulk Hogan. Yeah. And he didn't wrestle you. Hulk Hogan, I've challenged him. I've written letters to the World Wrestling Federation. I've challenged him and the moolah and all those so-called wimps who hide whenever I'm around. I'll challenge any man, woman, or beast in the ring. It's, right oh. here, right now, How anywhere, about... anytime. I was forced to retire in 1996, and I was 50. So I lasted until I was 50, and I, they had to take me out, you know, <laughs> crying and... <laughs> forced me out. The only way they could force me out was because my feet went bad. And I had two toes amputated from my right foot. So I have this peripheral neuropathy thing and I can lose my balance and fall. So that's not too good as a wrestler, although it might be good for my opponents. <laughs> but I never really have retired. I mean, because my husband and I started producing private wrestling tapes. And so I was directing and training still. I can still wrestle if I'm on my hands and knees. And just at Christmas time, I, I delivered a, a slamogram to a senior citizen here where I live. <laughs> so I don't know if they'll ever take it out of me. It, it, it just comes in different forms now, you know. As much as I loved it, it hurt. I mean, it really, it was painful. Um, it was emotionally draining. Because honestly, you had to be pushed past your, your physical limits of what you could normally do. Unfortunately, in the industry, lots of times women get hired just because they're pretty. And they, you know, might have been more inclined to succeed in a modeling world or a modeling industry. And then they get thrown into this world, and the first thing that happens to them is they get caught. They get bit by the bug. They want to wrestle. But it takes a different kind of weirdo, you know, that enjoys that kind of tomboy activity. It's not cut out for all of us. You know, you had a group of 20 and 21-year-olds 
you know, young ingenue types that, you know, really hadn't been out there, um, either in the wrestling world or in film and television. And, you know, they're looking for an opportunity. They don't want to piss anybody off. They kind of want to just, you know, try to play by the rules, you know, somewhat, um, and try to make a career for themselves. Some of them were just scared. You know, they didn't know where they were going. They didn't know if GLOW was going to lead to another job for them. They didn't see how they were going to parlay this into their next adventure in life. And I don't think that there was really any guidance on that with GLOW. It sure was an exciting hundred shows. Well, I don't think there are many people going to forget the gorgeous ladies of wrestling. No, they really deserve the tribute. After all, 100 shows, four years. I have a feeling this is the end of a beautiful friendship. At the end of Glow's run, it, you know, it was very successful. We were going into our fifth year. The ratings were through the roof. We were you know, pretty much at our zenith. And what happened was the man, Mr. Rickless, uh, who owned the Riviera Hotel and was the primary investor, decided to pull you know, his money out of, out of the project um, for personal reasons. I think there may have been some issues in his marriage, whatever, that, 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 that conflicted with him you know, pursuing GLOW. I heard a, a nasty little rumor that the reason why it stopped was because Michelin Rickless's wife, Pia Zadora, said, you better stop the show or I'm divorcing you. Because he, he liked to uh, play with the girls and she was mad, so he stopped the show. Kabosh, boom, over. We talked about doing some other things, like maybe doing live shows and, and that sort of thing after it ended. David McLean thought he could do it by himself didn't think he needed Matt Simber, and found out that no, they couldn't, they couldn't do it. They couldn't make it work without Matt Simber. They couldn't agree. They tried to get it going again, some of them, and it just, nothing happened. It just fell apart. We were told that maybe we would be getting calls back, but not, no one could say when. We were never notified that there was no more glow. The phone didn't ring, and the phone didn't ring, and the phone didn't ring. So we never had that moment of like, oh my God, this is the last time I'm gonna see you. This is gonna be my last match. It wasn't like that. There was really no closure. I was really sad. No going away party, no explanation, no canceling from the stations. I was broken hearted because I was so much in love with Matt Simmer, the director. And the things that I know now, I can tell it to his face. I just laugh about it and say, do you know I had a crush on you and I loved you? I would say it to him, life is too short, you know. Life is too short. And if you got something to say to somebody, tell it right there, because you never know, you might not get another chance to say it. So if I saw him again, I would say, do you know you made my heart pitter-patter? It's unfortunate, you know, that like, Life happens and everybody kind of parts ways. There were a lot of women there that were just in the same boat that we were, you know, wanted to act, were a little bit scared. We became like a little family, really, really. I mean, you, you could laugh and joke and cry and, and it was, yeah. I think a lot of us didn't really appreciate it until years later. You know, you think then about the love we all had for each other and the sisterhood and the camaraderie. When we were in the thick of it, it was just the day-to-day -day struggle of doing it and getting through it. I think about GLOW all the time. It was a sisterhood, you know, it was. Even though through all the thick and thin, what have you, but it was great. It was great, it was a great experience for all of us, for all of us, yeah. It's like, it's like for the past 15 years, it's been a missing part of me. 
like that piece of the puzzle has been taken out and it needs to be replaced back here. And I worry about them, or are they, are they eating? Are they doing okay? How's their family? What are they up to, you know? I want to thank them in person, in my own words, for making me shine, for making me be the, the star of that show, <laughs> the star of GLOW. You know, when people tell me I'm the icon, I say thank you, but there were 35 others in that show. But I want to, you know, pledge to them that I how much I love them, and I thank them, and I'll be indebted to them forever. <laughs> we are the only all-female wrestling show that's ever been. Um, as far, as far as I know, <laughs> the only thing I've ever seen. And uh, I think we made a very important contribution to society altogether, and I'd like everyone to get their credit for that. I, th I think, uh, for me, um, Fiji, I heard physically isn't doing well, and and I'm not sure what the stories are of everybody else. I had I have great stories because I feel like I had a really blessed life after Glow, and I just want to hear you know the other wrestlers say the same thing. I just want you know I just want to know that things are good for them. You know, it's been over 20 years since I've seen these girls. This is something I've kind of dreamed about. I didn't realize it was going to turn into a reality. They were so excited when uh, they heard that we were connecting again. This reunion, I'm, I'm just so hyped. I, I'm so excited about it. I'm going to go in a day early so that I can get to spend a little extra time with them. Little Egypt actually called me and said there was going to be a reunion. Now, I hadn't talked to Little Egypt in 20 some years. And I said, you know, I, I need to think about this. You know, give me a couple of days, you know, I'll get back to you. Because I separated into two categories, OK? There's the girls who are like, sorority sisters. But then all of a sudden you've got the production side of it, you know, and there were one or two people on the production side that I absolutely adored, but there were others that made me think twice, you know, like, do I really want to subject myself, you know, to possibly running into them again? Actually, when I saw Matt, I was surprised that he was so quiet. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't know. He, he seemed a little reserved, to tell you the truth. Uh, you remember him, that dirty old Italian. Oh, yeah. Let's go get my After I really thought long and hard about it, I realized that I got out of it what I wanted. I wanted a career in film and television. Glow launched me. I continued. I shouldn't have any qualms about that. It told me he was proud of his work and that he cared about the show enough to show up. Regardless of what he was feeling or what he might have thought, he got there and he was there for the girls. And I think he was especially there for Mount Fiji. I don't think he wanted to let her down. I'm, I'm so anxious, sis, to be 
you know, to go into this gathering because I haven't seen most of these girls, I'd say about 15 years. So to see them all again, and I don't want to cry. I'm going to this hanky you gave me for my lipstick, but I'm going to use it for my tears. It'll be tears of joy, not tears of sadness. You know what? When we enter, I'm going to go like this. Let's see if I stick to my words. And I'll see all the girls and whoever's there go, hello, darling, how are you? Where's the food? <laughs> I came for a luau. When she comes in, takes a look around the room, and sees 40 people, maybe, standing there. Now, granted, we all look a little bit different. <laughs> it might take her a while. But if she focuses slowly on each one of us, she might actually be able to uh, recognize us. I think it's going to be huge for Mountain Fiji. I, I just am so excited for her, even though she doesn't know what's going to happen yet. Matilda Hun told me, I can't tell you. Mom's the word. I can't tell you else to be there. Anxious. It's like, you know, like it's Christmas time waiting for the prize. And it's worth the wait. We're here. Oh my gosh, You're kidding me, oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh. That's okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. How do I look, girls? Hello. Who's here? The man, the man that I truly love, my Prince Charming. <laughs> How you doing? How you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I always had a crush on you. I truly, I truly was in love with this man. Do you know that I truly love Matt Simber? I, I from afar, I'm like, you know, like savoring. Oh my gosh, he's so handsome. He's such a But even though I heard rumors you're a womanizer, I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if I must say, to see every one of you today, I look at all your faces, and it brings back memories, such good memories. You can't get rid of the memories. And you know, even though there were good times, bad times, but this guy would say, you know what? If you don't like what you're doing here, there's the door. <laughs> <laughs> Fiji had a very close relationship with Matt Simber. She'd always call him coach. I think a lot of the girls actually, when they saw how much Fiji really depended on coach and really, yes, coach, yes, coach, yes, coach, then, then a lot of the girls kind of started coming around and going, okay, you know, what, 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 what's here? What do we need to respect? <laughs> He treated me very well, too, so, you know, it's hard to talk bad against him when he did so much good, but he was a prick. 
Matt Simber's creativity, and maybe even his mean, bossy director skills, all these innocent girls that were young and athletic and cute, the costuming, and then, of course, just the uh, pizzazz of the set, being that it was pink and purple. It's just really, really a great thing that came out of that. When I look back on GLOW now, I think of it as being one of the most exciting times of my life. A lot of fun. Um, wish it didn't end. I still have this dream that maybe one day, one just one more time, we'll get to do it again. Being on that show, being a part of the history, being a part of it was the most fun I ever had in my life. Who knew, you know, that I'd, I'd be a gorgeous lady of wrestling? You know, I'm not saying everything was sunshine and roses, but it was an amazing experience. I'm glad when I was 25 years old that I had this unique experience. For those of us that, you know, weren't at a university with a sorority, these are my sisters, man, you know? You know, when I got married, my mom said, do you want the money or do you want the wedding? And I thought, you know, I want the wedding because I want to be able to have those memories. The money's just going to go. And the memories of, of GLOW are like that. I knew that I would look back and be so glad that I did this. Because whoever gets this opportunity and how neat to have it with my best friend and my sister. Whoever thought wrestling was going to become that big a part of our life. But we used to get so used to, you get so used to slamming your body into walls and, you know, we would purposely like slam against walls to like, you know, toughen ourselves up. So when we would have like parties, we'd be, it, we'd be throwing each other around, hitting the walls. They'd call the police because we were making so much noise and people thought we were killing each other. Of course, the industry, the lifestyle kills a lot of our dear friends, way too young. So there's this whole part of me that's really mad at the industry, but I love the wrestlers, and I respect them so much as these really talented people. What is it about us that makes us alike? What makes us um, alike is that we're different from most gals. <laughs> I'm gonna do my rhyme, my verse. Yeah, we all have rhyme. Fiji, Fiji, I love to hear. Thank you, fans, you're all so dear. I'm always happy I don't sing blues. When you're on my side, how can I lose? Hoi! Here's the glow crown. It's just like we are. It's a little, a little battered, a little worn, you know, not totally broken, <laughs> but it still sparkles. <laughs> just so many people, I am mama. And, you know, it's, like I said, I, I am big bad mama, I'm mama. I had three things I wanted to do. TV, play, publish some Playboy, and give out an Academy Award. Well, I probably won't give out the Academy Award, but I've already done the other two, and so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm grateful for that. That was pretty fun. When we'd interview, you know, we would just start talking about something, and I would say, I feel very, very good about myself because I've lost 
I've lost weight. I've lost a significant amount of weight, and I think that you <laughs> could stand to lose some weight also. Well, it's not that I need to lose weight. No, it is say. actually well, that you need to lose no, weight. It's no, you're in denial. It seems like it's shifted a little bit. It's, it's shifted it's and shifted added. Into, no. It's not so much added. It's no, it is so coming. much added. It took forever. I had glitter in my hair for 10 years after Glow ended. Glitter is like permanent. We do know that all Americans are basically very lazy and are puny wimps. So uh, I whipped them into shape. It was really about just connecting again and trying to um, have that opportunity to tell each other how much we loved each other and how much we enjoyed working with each other. I like someone up to come up to me and think I'm some feeble little old lady in a chair or whatever they think, and I'd like do just like this, and I'd go, oh yeah? Come on, take a piece of me, come on. Not all people sitting in wheelchairs are weak. <laughs> Yeah, that's better. Ah! I'm getting fired up now. Come here. Come on, guys. Come on, camera guys. Come on. I need you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Now, my dear, we're going to test your reflexes. Reflexes, fine. I heard California Doll invented a new type of parachute. Yeah, it opens on impact. <laughs> What would you say is the difference between Palestina and, say, Matilda the Hun? Oh, about 200 pounds. I'm 